Hey there, I'm Mecha and I welcome you to the conclusion of my Fire Emblem Three Houses Byleth Solo on Manning Mode. If you somehow missed part one of this adventure, you can check it out right here. I'm going to do a quick recap just so you know where we left off and then we're going to jump right into the post time skip part of this run. A quick summary of the rules. Maps have to be played using only Byleth. Other characters have to be undeployed and if they're force deployed, they are not allowed to do things like fight or use spells or gambits. I am allowed to recruit other characters, and in fact at this point I've collected every single one that's available on the route I'm playing, which is the church route. These other characters can be included in monastery activities, and they can be paired with Byleth as a Jutans. I would say our Byleth solo is going pretty well so far. We have managed to avoid using anyone that isn't banned solo, and we've managed to level her up all the way to a level 30 Wyvern Rider with these stats, so she's ready to promote the Wyvern Lord. Her strength, speed and charm are particularly outstanding, mostly because she's getting all the stat boosters in the game. She's also mastered several classes and skills that we can use to our advantage, so things are looking good. No matter what chapter lies ahead of us, we should be able to customize her to our needs. Except that the first chapter after the time skip is of course chapter 13, Hunting by Daybreak. Although I like to call it Softlock by Daybreak, this is widely considered one of the worst chapters in Three Houses. In the church route, you start with only Seteth and Byleth, and what's worse, you don't get a prep screen, so you're stuck with whatever class, weapons and skills they had during chapter 12. That means that even though Ban Solo is level 30, I cannot promote her yet, and if the skill set and stats that I have somehow aren't good enough, I have to go back to the previous chapter, change it up into what is hopefully good enough, and then try this chapter again. And maybe repeat that process a couple more times. Honestly, I was half expecting a soft lock in this chapter because the enemies are so strong and fast and throughout the map the entire Black Eagle House comes back, so keeping them out of combat would be pretty much impossible. But thankfully, somehow I got really lucky on the first few turns, dodging all kinds of arrows and gambits and critting almost everything with the killer bow. The time skip replenished the battalion I had, so battalion vantage, which I equipped for chapter 12, was useless, but nonetheless Byleth seemed to just shrug off or dodge everything thrown at her. I did have to use a few Defiant Pulses, but no resets were necessary, and honestly I'm not sure how I did that. The other students were never really in danger, as I was always able to lure enemies away from them with Byleth, and in the end I routed the map before killing Polardo twice. Damn. use this power for the greater good. I guess overall I might have been worrying too much about this one since in regular maddening playthroughs it already basically is a Bleth solo up to a certain point and the hard part is keeping unused students out of it. My run just takes that to an extreme but it has the best possible setup to do it since my Bleth is so powerful. Alright chapter 14, yet another chapter where we have to defend Garrick Mach. I feel like we've just done this. Anyway this time there are two points to defend. One on the right, where Byleth starts, that's only one tile wide, and one on the left, that's three tiles wide. I'm sure you can see the problem already. Byleth is only one person, and no matter how good she is, she cannot be on two tiles at once, let alone four. Enemies will always try to end up on a defend tile if they can, and the moment they end their turn there, it's a game over. Now, to an extent, Byleth is actually able to hold the fort, even on the three tile wide one. This is because while enemies will always have a defend tile to stand on, they simply cannot resist the temptation to also attack if they can, so as long as Byleth can counter them and kill the enemy that's about to seize, we're good. However, if we don't kill the enemy, for example because they gambit, or we don't one round them, or they simply cannot attack from that tile, we lose. And there is also plenty of problems with the right hand tile. There is a Pegasus Knight that will seize at turn 1 if they are not killed or blocked immediately, but if Byleth is not on the left hand tiles by turn 2, she cannot stop the enemies there from seizing. Thankfully, there is an NPC Swordmaster that shows up on the right hand tile that can actually defend it for a while, so as long as I make sure to get rid of the Pegasus Knight, we are safe. Here is something to yeah! <gasps> it won't be in vain. But unfortunately, eventually the NPCs will either die or move off the tile, and from there there is no way to prevent a loss. 
Even if, through some miracle, the NPC dodges every attack, eventually she will be tempted to run downwards because she's programmed to walk straight to the ballista and set the place on fire. And because of her AI, she doesn't even attack any enemies on her way, even if they're wide open for it. I have tried and tried and tried, but sadly, as far as I know, this is the first chapter and perhaps the only main story chapter that cannot be soloed with Byleth. And it's not because Byleth isn't strong enough or doesn't have the right setup. I don't think there's any possible setup, class, weapon or ability that could help her here. It's the fact that she's all alone that makes this impossible. If you have any ideas on how it could be done, you're free to post them in the comment section. I still have my save file, but rest assured, I have tried just about everything. So. The answer to the question, can Byleth solo all of Maddening Mode, I'm afraid the answer to that is no. I'm pretty sure that I succeeded at doing it on Hard Mode, but it's been a long while, so I'm not sure how I did it, and I lost the footage. Or at least, that was how the story went. At this point in time, I'd given up and conceded that I would need the help of some other unit to get through this chapter. I ended up enlisting the help of Catherine to defend the right hand side, so that Byleth could focus on the left. I just accepted that Byleth could not win on her own, as powerful as she might be. But it turns out that someone else took on this exact same challenge in the time it took me to get this first part out, and that person is Omega Evolution. He also did a Byleth solo, on Manning mode, on Church Route, and what's even worse for me, he completed it, including this chapter. I decided to see if he, too, had to cheat to make it through. And sure enough, at the start of this chapter, I hear him say, I'm pretty scared of this chapter, not gonna lie. Because we might not be able to solo this one. And then he proceeds to do it. He has almost no trouble doing it. How? We almost maxed out Wyvern Lord in the, in the map. <laughs> in one map. <laughs> That's insane. Well, he employs an interesting strategy that lets him defend both sides. He takes out one of the enemies on the right side, just like I did, and then flies to the left to defend over there. However, in his case, he has the NPC Swordmaster run outside and choke the point between the fences. This buys him enough time to take out the enemies threatening to seize on the left side. Then, once the left side is safe for a bit, he returns to the right side to take out the handful of enemies there. There isn't that many, and once it's been cleared out, he can focus on the left side completely. So I told myself, if this guy can do it, so can I. I am not going to release a video out there that tells you it cannot be done, only to have a million people point out that someone else did it someone that isn't even a self-proclaimed firebomb expert, and did it with seemingly no trouble at all. That would make me look terribly stupid. So, I got back to this chapter again, having kept my save file all along, and almost immediately I encounter one big problem. My Byleth cannot reach the same points that his did. Omega Evolution's Byleth had a massive 12 movements compared to my measly 9, and this is with both of us having the March Ring equipped. Turns out that not only did Omega Evolution not forget to complete the Ash Catherine paralogue for the plus one move stat booster like I did, but he also used a DLC item called Sacred Gilwind Shoes that give another plus two movement. So it was much easier for him to go back and forth between the sides than it was for me. So once again, there was an opportunity for me to give up. I could just say, well, yeah, well, he could do it because he has the DLC, but that doesn't prove that it cannot be done without it. That strategy where he allows the Swordmaster to run outside and fight the enemies for a bit was something I hadn't thought of. So with renewed enthusiasm, I loaded my save and started doing attempts again. So, after some experimentation, I came to the conclusion that I had to gambit the two initial enemies on the right side so they couldn't trap the NPC or seize the tile. This bought the Swordmaster time to run outside while Bullet is off to the left to stop the enemies there. It took a bit of puzzling and divine pulsing, but pretty quickly I managed to get the run to a point where all the enemies on the right hand side were dead and all I had to do with Byleth was mop up everything. Now, keep in mind, I wasn't recording this part, I was just playing around to see if it was possible, and when I got to this point in relatively quick fashion, I thought to myself, Alright, seems good, I'll record a proper attempt later, and then I went to do something else. When I got back to the game and tried to record a real run, I realized one annoying thing. This was not reliable. <laughs> not reliable at all. The sword mass is pretty strong, but they also die pretty easily, and if she dies too early, I cannot get back to the right side in time. Also, if that Pegasus Knight stays alive, he can toast to a space that he can seize from next turn, and the sword mass is not going to go stop him. That Pegasus needs to die, and the sword mass needs to survive, so... I had to start resetting a bunch until I finally got to a point where the Swordmaster did enough work. And after I think about 10 resets, I managed to get to that point again, and now it was just a matter of not fucking up. This was not a free battle yet, not by any means. I was still in uncharted territory, I knew that if I somehow ran myself out of Divine Pulses, my punishment would be another reset marathon. And even from this position, things were not set in stone. I could still get checkmated into a position where both seize points would be in enemy range. 
But thankfully, I managed to catch the break on the left side, which allowed me to get back to the right side and save it after the Swordmaster bit the dust. Was it over from here? Absolutely not. I still had 7 Divine Pulses left, but I also still had the entire left side enemies to deal with. Most annoyingly, the stream of Pegasus Knights and Paladins that keep coming in every year on the turn. And there's also several groups with other threatening enemies, such as Snipers, Banshee Mages and Warriors. I made use of Vantage, Alert Stance Plus and my trusty Killer Bow to stay alive. However, very annoyingly, the Pegasus seemed to like going for the Seize Point sometimes, even if Byleth was in their attacking range, kinda like the enemies in the infamous Chapter 10 of Conquest. I believe the AI determines what they do by whether Baleth is between them and the Seize Point or not, and if she isn't, they will fly upwards and ignore her, and that was really annoying. Another limiting factor was my weapon uses. I'm ashamed to say it, but I didn't actually pack that many killer bows, and my supply of them was actually rather low. Iron bows did not actually want to kill the Pegasus Knights, and Baleth couldn't double them either, and that presented a problem at times. Still, I soldiered on with what I had and got myself towards the group near the boss. I almost managed to lock myself through it despite their awkwardly good hit rates, but in the end I took one hit too many and died. I was now down to my last three Divine Pulses. I took down most of the threatening enemies with my Killer Bow and it broke during an enemy phase and subsequently I got hit by a Gambit from one of the warriors. I healed myself with Healing Focus and finished off the last remnants around me with the Iron Bow. I was now in range of the boss, but unfortunately the goal of this map is to route, not to kill the boss. The only way to make it kill boss is to escort the NPC Swordmaster to the Ballista to set the place on fire, but as you know that ship has sailed many turns ago. I decided to take out a remaining Armor Knight first for some reason while moving out in the open, and this got me punished immediately by a group of reinforcements and the Ballista, reducing me to 1 HP, and my battalion was now almost completely depleted. I moved to the right to heal, but by doing this, I allowed the Pegasi rune to escape to the north. I tried to salvage it by moving after them, but I ended up losing my battalion and subsequently, I lost another Divine Pulse. I went back to a turn that there was only one Armor Knight near me, and instead I killed Randolph with a fresh Silver Bow and then parked myself on his healing tile. For my house! For justice, I will not be defeated! Mother. As a flyer, Baleth didn't gain terrain bonuses, but I did get the healing. And this is when some bad news slowly dawned on me. Not only do the reinforcements keep coming even after Randolph died, they are infinite. Every single odd turn for the rest of eternity, two Pegasus Knights and a Paladin come in to attack me and eventually would run me out of steam, which of course they did, and I died again. The only way to end the map would be to rout the other enemies along with them. So now it was time to Divine Pulse backwards a lot of turns of waiting and figure out a new strategy for this final bit. What's my strategy? I decided I would fly up to the small clusters of enemies still standing around and kill them. Hopefully the reinforcements would chase me a bit and then end in my range as I'm routing the map. I went to the right side first to take care of the two Pegasus Knights, and then I took out the two enemies near the Ballista. Reinforcements did come in this turn, but I just kept on going towards the last enemy on the northern Ballista. Now at this point, I was so low on HP that I could not actually attack the sniper with my bow without getting counter-killed, so I used an Iron Sword and then parked myself out of range of the reinforcements. Then, for one final time, with one Defined Pulse left, I equipped myself with my trusty Silver Bow and parked myself on a forest. You might wonder why I'm not dismounting to get the avoid bonus, but I found that sometimes this is cause for the paladin to gambit me instead of attacking me normally, and I'd rather he attack me so I can counterattack. Now, for one final time, Byleth took on this repetitive wave of enemies, and finally she ended up coming out on top. In 22 turns, I have protected Garrick Mach, and cleaned up what was otherwise going to be a very tainted run. I'd say it was worth it, but... God damn, I had to rewrite and re-record two and a half pages of script because of this. Mega Evolution, this is all your fault. Next up, some post time skip paralogues, starting with the Casper Mercedes one. I wasn't sure if this one was possible, and when playing it with my current kit, it didn't seem to be. Caspar and Mercedes start very far away from Byleth, and they can be surrounded pretty easily. 
In addition, the enemies on this chapter are pretty hard for Byleth to kill. There's these super sturdy demonic beasts and a lot of magic and bow users with 3 range. To make killing them on enemy phase possible, I repaired my longbow and forged another one, costing me almost all of my wood steel, but its accuracy still left something to be desired since it's usually being fired at 3 range, often in forests, and the longbow stats aren't very good. I could go sniper instead to get 3 range with normal bows, but then I wouldn't be able to fly over forest, so that was not really an option. The reason I want to go over forest fast is because I'm on a timer. Apparently there's a lot of ambush reinforcements waiting to kill Casper and Mercedes, and those gave me a ton of trouble. From my experience, they activate either on turn 10 or when Balath crosses the cliff. However, luckily right before this paralogue started, I certified for the warrior class with a 30% chance, which let me master the Wrath skill through an auxiliary battle. With the combination of Wrath, Advantage, as well as hit plus 20, Bioth's chances of killing these enemies on enemy phase went way up, though it was a little risky since I had to let go of Alert Stance Plus to fit it all. I also made use of the Blessed Bow and the Silver Bow to kill two of the demonic beasts more quickly, so that Casper and Mercedes were free to escape from the right. Those guys were giving me quite a hard time since they cannot be crit. So this chapter cost me a lot of resources to do, but in return I get the Raphael Gem. The Raphael Gem negates critical hits and effective damage which is super nice to have. Byleth is often flying around, so there's always that bow weakness to worry about. Of course, Byleth could already dismount to get rid of the bow weakness, but that does cut into her flexibility a bit. After all, she cannot mount and dismount on the same turn, so that means that the turn after she dismounts, she either has to mount and then have a weakness to arrows again, or stay dismounted and have less mobility. So basically the Raphael gem is an increase in flexibility, and of course it also negates critical hits. The Pevise effect that it normally gives to Mercedes is unfortunately not available for Byleth since she doesn't have the matching crest, but that's okay, this is good enough. And then we have the Marianne Paralogue. I hated this one so much. It's not just that it's hard, it was also just really, really long. The monster animations take forever, and making sure Marianne is safe from all the monsters near her is more trial and error than something that requires actual strategizing. I had no qualms about having Marianne light the way with a torch for a bit, because all it did was give me information I could have memorized, rather than letting me do things I couldn't do before. I guess it does allow me to attack certain monsters, otherwise hidden in the fog if I wanted to, but generally Byleth was busy using Alert Stance Plus. Actually what gave me the most trouble on this map was not the monsters, but the actual humans on this map. There are mages with the death spell that could do a lot of damage to Byleth pretty easily, even if she's hiding on a forest, because magic ignores the terrain bonuses. And then there's also some bow users. Now to ban solo, these were just a minor annoyance, but they could also end my run instantly if they reached Marianne, who was hiding out in that fort up north. The monsters cannot make their way in there since, you know, the gaps in the sides are too small for them, but the humans could just walk through and kill her instantly. In the end, it turned out that the most effective strategy was to hunt down all the human enemies, especially the Physic Bishops, and then aggro Maurice, the boss, into attacking Byleth as she hid in that fort with Marianne, slowly chipping him down with the Silver Bow in enemy phase, and I used the Brave Bow in player phase if I could. And that's how I beat it, but god, I hated this map so much. And then we have the Petra Bernadetta Paralogue, not nearly as bad as the Marianne one, but still pretty annoying. The objective, according to the game, is Petra arrives or routes, but the Petra arrives part is fake and doesn't actually end the chapter. Instead, it just procs a bunch of reinforcements that also appear if you reach a certain fort with Petra, or if you wait until turn 10, so generally it's just a route map, but a tricky one. Petra and Bernadetta have no real safe places to hide since there's enemies everywhere, though most of them are not aggressive. Also, once these reinforcements come out, there is a couple of commanders among them, including Hubert, that will try to seize the fake arrive tile. If they do, it's a game over. Since Petra and Bernadetta have a hard time reaching that tile, that generally means Byleth has to defend two objectives, and we all know how bad that can go. I found the easiest way to go was to just leave the left side alone and focus down the enemies on the right hand side so I could move the two forced units towards the upper right corner. That way, Byleth has an easier time taking out the enemies on the right side and take out any enemies on their way there, whether they're trying to take out these forced units or seize the objective. After killing all the aggressive enemies, it was just a matter of mopping up every idling enemy on the left side and making sure that they wouldn't run away from Byleth and go for Petra or Bernadetta. And that was it. It is done.
Chapter 15, the Valley of Torment was so forgettable that I actually forgot to write about it in the initial version of my script. I only realized this when I had already recorded the voiceover for every other chapter, so that's why I might sound a little different. It's the same map as the Ingrid Dorothea paralogue from part 1, only this time you start at the bottom right and to win you just need to kill the boss in the upper left. The only challenges in between are recruiting Ash and protecting Judith. Ash can be recruited by defeating him with Byleth and then choosing to persuade instead of kill. You... you want to spare me? Why? And Judith spawns as an NPC and her dying causes a game over, but of course the best way to protect her is to end the map. Gwendol was pretty trivial and honestly, so was this entire chapter. Let's just move on to the next one. Thank you. For this chapter I got my certification as a bow knight and I decided this map was a great one to try it out. I was just so tired of not having free range at all against those enemy archers, and on a map without much terrain the bow knight is almost as mobile as the wyvern lord. Between Vantage, Wrath and the bow knight's massive 1-4 range, there are very few things on this map that even get the chance to attack Balath, so the lower stats of the bow knight don't really matter. It turned out to be worth all the riding training that I did, as this map went by quite easily. Only Lada's Lava turned out to be a bit of a nuisance with her gambit, but with proper positioning I managed to dodge a fatal one and take her out. Yes! Ah! Lady Edelgard! What's my strategy? The monsters with their critical immunity were a bit annoying, but I could escape them on the small bridges on the left side to deal with Lorenz, who I of course spared, if only to have an extra advanced drills unit. I yield. Though I will not beg for my life. That would be unbecoming, wouldn't it? You're inviting me to join you? But to abandon House Gloucester? No, I can convince my father. I will help you topple the Empire, I swear it. Chapter 16 is one of the most brain-dead maps imaginable. All you have to do to win is kill the Death Knight, who is located in the center of the map. I got blocked on my way to him for a bit because I was playing as a bow knight. I got into wrath and vantage range then and tried to trick the death knight into attacking me instead of using a gambit. Whether I kill you or you kill me, I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> but he ran away, so I chased after him. Honestly, at this point, the main story maps are so much easier than the paralogues, it's it's kind of embarrassing. Speaking of paralogues, here is the Lysithia Ferdinand paralogue. This one I tried briefly with Lysithia and Ferdinand in their 4 move classes, but it wasn't working out. Violet was very restricted in where she could go to protect them, and somehow the enemies were always checkmating me into positions where they'd get attacked. The fact that the enemies were high move wyverns, assassins with pass and hard to double sword guys didn't help either. So I gave up on it, temporarily. I needed to come back to it later when I had the time to train Lysithia and Ferdinand a bit. Don't worry, I didn't cheat, I just kept them as adjutants to Byleth, which the rules I set for myself do allow. I put them both into classes with more mobility, Pegasus Knight and Cavalier respectively. It's kind of similar to how I raised Edelgard and Manuela for maps they were forced into, just to keep them away from combat. I also gained knowledge from Rangor that killing certain bosses eliminates entire group of enemies from the map, so I made use of that by killing the southern boss to turn that whole part of the map into a safe zone. Then moved on to eliminate the others piece by piece. It still took some doing and redoing, but in the end I ended up getting all the treasure and I even saved some of the villagey things for a silver lance. In the time it took me to prepare for this paralogue, the serial Hilda ones expired, but that one seemed to be beyond hope anyway, since it's basically the most anti-solo a map could possibly be. It has a zone to defend, two forced units on opposite sides of the map, and I have to keep at least one green unit alive for the entire map. There is no way Byleth was going to be able to do this on our own. All our allied troops were wiped out. We won't be able to defend this place. So at this point, I think I've exhausted all the paralogue that I'll be able to complete. The only one left on my screen is Land of Lake with Leone and Lernhard, but that one starts you off surrounded by about a dozen enemies from three different directions, so I don't think that one will be possible. With paralogs out of the way, you might think that I can spend all my time exploring now, but there's not much of a point in that either. 
My professor level has been maxed out for ages, so the only fruitful things I can spend my professor points on are the training crown tournaments for a bit of money, faculty training, and cooking. Cooking doesn't do much when the main missions are so easy and the training grounds are unreliable since I cannot use Byleth. I have to rely on my other units to win, usually Catherine, and if she cannot win, it's not going to give me anywhere near as much money as an auxiliary battle. That just leaves faculty training, or as it's called now, advanced drills, and honestly that does barely anything for my ranks. At this point, every month is so boring, but I still feel like I need to do things just because of how daunting I know the final chapter to be, so I try to use my time to get certified for new classes with skills that might be useful. And of course, gardening is pretty important to get more stat boosters, and exploring does let me buy things from merchants, such as master suits from Anna, or gifts and seeds from the other guys. I've also unlocked a dark merchant, Hello. but I haven't really found a purpose for him. Tell your friends. Choosing to go battling, on the other hand, is pretty appealing, even without paralogs, because I can earn rare ores or a ton of gold from the generic battles, not to mention that I get a little bit of renown from them. But because at this point, the parts between maps are getting so grindy and tedious for me, I decide to see if I can get by by only doing the bare minimum. I explore every week, do the gardening, then get out and skip to the next week. This way Byleth can gain 3 to 4 stat points in strength or speed per month, and that might just be all I need, seeing as how complete my skill set feels right now. And if there's something unforeseen that ends up softlocking me later on, it'll be less work to go back and redo it. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the next chapter, chapter 18, Enbar Infiltration. The goal is to kill the two bosses, the Death Knight and Hubert. The Death Knight starts fairly close to your starting position, and while he is on a tile that gives him a lot of avoid, you move off of it in maddening mode, so it was fairly easy to bait him. Unfortunately, he likes to use gambits, so I couldn't take him out on enemy phase, and the next player phase, when I attempted to kill him, I hilariously missed a 90% hit on him. To make matters even funnier, he got healed up by an enemy healer and shouted, I LIVE! In that Yuritsa fashion that I've come to love. After that I killed him though. From there, it was a matter of getting to Hubert. Now Byleth was getting seriously worn down by the enemies here. There's a lot of gambits, big flying dragons, and long range threats that I couldn't just cheese with Vantage plus Wrath. I died more times than I'd like to admit, but even still it took me less than 15 minutes, including all of my divine pulses, to get in range of Hubert. Hubert's bolting is a big threat that almost kills Byleth, and combined with all the bolting mages near him, she can definitely die, but I simply flew to the left of him to take out that mage, then waited a turn right outside of Hubert's range before flying in and taking him out. Hubert would have killed me had I not gotten a lucky critical hit, but the odds were definitely in my favor, and had it failed I still had a massive 7 divine pulses left. I should have disposed of you a long time ago. I will rectify that failure here. Allow me to demonstrate! We must place our faith in Her Majesty. Excellent. Between this map and the next one, Enbar Palace, there is actually no calendar section, so it was just straight into the action here. The biggest annoyance on this map is that almost every enemy has some kind of gambit available, and even though I have a lot of charm, they still have somewhere between 20 and 30 hit on me depending on gambit boosts from their end. At first I thought I could be clever by gambiting the assassin carrying the door key to avoid him gambiting me, but it turned out that in order to do that I had to be in range of both ballistas, which got me surrounded and killed. In hindsight, that assassin was insignificant since the door can be opened by any door key, but hey, whatever. The point is I got through the door and then died a lot, because the enemies in the throne room do not mess around. Thankfully the dude comes in just in time to distract them, and I know to use the time he buys me wisely since he is toast the moment a mage looks in his direction. Unfortunately, I still die like a million times and I decide to reset and try something different. I snuck through the side door on the left instead so that I could take advantage of the duo's distraction, but also take out the Dark Mage commanding the Fire Orb. It still didn't exactly go flawlessly, as there was still a lot of mages in my path that would either gambit me or just do half or more of my HP, with hit rates way too decent for my liking. The biggest drag wasn't even dying, it was watching all these enemies move on camera and then moving back through all of that with Divine Pulse, 
I find myself even using the skip feature every now and then, just to make it go by a little bit quicker, because it gets old real fast. But eventually, down to 6 Divine Pulses, I found myself in range of Edelgard. I needed at least one critical hit to kill her, and she would instantly kill me on the counterattack with 57 displayed hits, so suffice it to say I had to get lucky. I got out my evasion ring to reduce her hit a bit, and I went for it. Professor, I suppose you think you can defeat me, is that right? But I will never give up. Even if my arms and legs failed me, I would still find a way to move forward. I will smash that false goddess and her minion into the ground. I will fight to free this world from her vile grasp. Here is something to believe in! Yeah! <laughs> Sorry, Edugard, but it looks like you should have just stuck with the wyvern path I tried to put you on long ago. I want it. To walk with you. Next up, we're going underground for some dubstep at Shambhala. Going into this, I was expecting this chapter to be one of the easier ones, since from my memory it's a fairly simple kill boss with a relatively low enemy density. And indeed, when I started going through the map, none of the enemies even moved before I got in their range. I opened the chest that they put right in my face as it has the bow of Zoltan, a nice welcome present. I sneak on through until I get to the center room, where I die to a couple of gambits, but after taking it a little slower, it turns out to be fairly trivial. More enemies started moving, but only once I was already near the entrance of the center room where the boss is. Those weird Viscam thingies literally do one damage to me with 25 hits, so I have no idea what they are trying to accomplish. I intentionally unequip my weapons when I open a door to the boss room so I don't get hit by gambits, but that cheeky move doesn't pay off as I get attacked normally instead. And after a long struggle where I fail to get through, I decide to instead try and run the enemies out of gambits. A couple of assassins are in the meanwhile trying to sneak off with some treasure, but I really don't care. From behind, a couple of Titanuses try to kill me, but since they're so big that only one of them can attack me at a time, they end up forming some neat line where they just don't do anything. Finally, the way to the boss opens up, and once again I find myself at HP too low to survive a counter, but... So you have shown yourself, Feldstar. Or should I say, Sophus? I will spill every drop of blood in your body to fulfill the long-standing goal of the Agarthans! And that's it. We have one final chapter left, and I suspect that it will be the hardest of them all. Let's put on some funeral flowers and fight the final boss. Here we are, the final chapter. The last obstacle standing in our way is the Berserk Rhea. Her stats actually don't look too threatening by themselves, though we should keep in mind she's got Ancient Dragon Skin, which halves all damage taken. And then she has a barrier that reduces it by another 70%. In a normal playthrough you could break her barrier with one unit and then take advantage with another unit, but since I only have one unit period, that is not an option for me. As if all of that is not enough, Vital Defense makes it so that I cannot get a critical hit, and Divine Dragonhorn will keep healing her as long as there is a white beast within 10 spaces of her, so before we should even attempt to fight her, we should deal with those. Now, white beasts are pretty buff, but they fly, so they are weak to my bows. The most annoying aspect of them will probably be their triple HP bar, and the fact that they get Miracle on their last one, which has a chance to let them survive a lethal blow. However, a bow attack will break their barrier in one hit, so I should be able to drain their HP bars quickly. There are three white beasts below the starting position and four more around Rhea, so I've got my work cut out for me. But there's also a lot of other enemies that will give me trouble. Almost every enemy has a brave or silver weapon or some kind of gambit. The fastest enemies on the map are the silver sword heroes with 47 attack speed, which my Byleth can fortunately double thanks to 52 speed. That 52 speed is not a coincidence, I kept these thresholds in mind as I was giving out gardening staff boosters, making sure to get just enough speed carrots on her to reach this threshold, and then getting Rocky Burdocks to maximize her strength. As you can see, I managed to get her up to a massive 70 strength, and her other stats are pretty high too, especially that overkill 63 charm. For skills, I'm going with my good old kit of hit plus 20, wrath, advantage, bow prowess 5, and close counter, though I'm keeping the option of alert stance plus over hit plus 20 in mind to increase her survivability. On my first attempts, I was reminded by Siddhath that the southern stronghold would spawn more white beasts, and since I got held up a bit too far from it, and even got hit by a gambit, I decided it was time for a reset. On my second attempt, I managed to capture the stronghold, and I almost got one white beast down in the process. 
Raya transformed, but it doesn't seem to have changed her very much. Raya! Not even I have seen this form. It does apparently enable her surging light skill, which lets her use staggering blow, which is her AoE attack, regardless of whether she attacked last turn. Normally, monsters are only able to use their AoE attack after they attack one of the units normally, but Rhea is going to be able to use hers every turn. However, Rhea's AoE attack, or Frost, isn't the most threatening thing in the world. Definitely not while I'm on the other side of the map. Capturing the stronghold causes a couple of enemies to move, so I decide to chill on the southern fort, dismounting and taking on the enemies as they come to me. The seal strength skill on the white dragons is actually really annoying and prevents me from one hit KOing enemies sometimes. And even though I'm on a fort, the enemy hit rates are scarily high, especially those on the white beasts. Before I've even killed more than one white beast, my battalion is already down to the red, and once I'm done with the initial onslaught, they fled the scene, and Byleth is truly on her own. From here, I decided to carefully work my way through the white beasts. I had no idea how hard Rhea would be, so I wanted to be quick about it, and on hard mode I've actually been very close to running out the 99 turn limit. I killed another white beast, and then I got started on the golem on the right. Those guys have 3 range, so I can't do much about them on enemy phase. I couldn't get past the one tile wide gate though, so I just made use of his weapon weakness and brave axed him into oblivion. <laughs> then I made the mistake of stepping into Rhea's long range and got punished for it, losing another divine pulse. From there, I snuck over to the left side and cleared out of enemies as well. By turn 32, it looked like the map was mostly mine, and by turn 37, there were no more white beasts left, and in theory, Rhea should be vulnerable now. I just had to fight a couple more golems, and one generic, and then we'd be done. Unfortunately, I was a bit careless in disposing of those guys, and they turret killed me a couple of times, bringing me down to 4 divine pulses. But by turn 53, all that stood between me and sweet, sweet victory was one random great knight and of course Rhea herself. Now as you can see, I really don't do much damage to Rhea and she also kept using her AoE on an enemy phase, so this was gonna be a very long one. Since I'm doing so little damage per hit, my most effective weapons are Brave Ones, which I had limited uses of, especially since I used a couple of them on the Golems already. I had the Thunderbrand and I brought a couple more, but still, this was gonna take forever with her 4 health bars. Also, she had a very scary 6% critical rate on me. I started out with a couple of lucky dodges, which meant that I didn't have to spend much time healing. I also tried to keep the Great Knight alive and out of my range so that I could use him for RNG abuse if I needed to change the order of things a little bit. At this point, I'm thanking the developers from the bottom of my heart that Rhea didn't have any of the skills like Renewal or Throne Defeat herself between turns. When I was about to finish one of her health bars at around turn 66, she activated Miracle, and I knew things were going to be hella annoying. She had two more, stronger health bars to go, my supply of Braves was already somewhat depleted, and Rhea's Defiant Strength was soon going to be a factor. She was not going down without a fight, and she did indeed hit me with her AoE at one point, draining another Divine Pulse use. And then soon after, I lose another, due to a lucky critical hit. So this is how it ends. In fact, this critical hit got me twice. So I was down to one Defiant Pulse now. I had to be really careful about Defiant Strength, which would apparently activate with Rhea below 25%, and I calculated that to be 47 or less HP. This is when I broke out the Brave Bow, to increase my evasion rate due to Bow Prowess 5.
Now, Rhea was at her last health bar, and I was down to my last Defiant Pulse. Rhea now had Vantage, though it would only activate at half HP or below, aka around 99 HP. It was turn 81, so I had 18 turns left on the clock to kill her. With the Brave Bow, I was doing 28 damage, and with the Thunderbrand, I was doing 32, so if I didn't miss or need to heal, it would take around 7 turns to kill her. It looked like I was gonna win, provided nothing went awfully wrong. I decided to start kiting in and out of range to minimize my chances of dying. And then, as I dug through my convoy to see what my options were, I saw something funny. I could use gauntlets as well, and because they were brave, they were looking like decent options. However, since you can only attack with gauntlets if you're not on a mount, I couldn't cancel out of Rhea's range after using them, so I had to be very careful. Slowly the face-off continued, with Rhea's vantage now activated and then Byleth dealing punch after punch. On turn 90, Rhea was down to 58 HP, and had exactly 8 Brave Bow uses left, enough to finish her in 8 attacks. I got hit by her attack with 45 hit, and if she hit me now with her AoE I would be dead, but she rarely seemed to hit me with it, so I took my distance and prayed. And she missed. We're down to 9 turns on the clock. I could attack, but if I did, she could kill me on enemy phase with advantage, so I decided to heal again. What's my strategy? 8 turns left, and all that could go wrong now was Miracle combined with 2 lucky hits from Rhea. My Brave Bow would break after battle, but I decided to go for it. Now her AoE will probably hit me with my broken Brave Bow in hand. But it missed. Then I made a big mistake. I moved in for the kill, but realized too late that Vantage was still active. Since I was already committed to my movement, I equipped the bow instead and healed. If she didn't hit me now, I'd be able to go for the kill fairly safely, and she did indeed miss. There were 6 turns left on the clock, I had a 100% hit rate. The only way she could beat me is a lucky 6% critical. I won! One Divine Pulse and five turns off the turn cap. Holy god. So, that's it. That's that question answered. Byleth can solo the entirety of the church route on manning mode. That was quite an adventure. I gotta say, that was actually a lot of fun, trying to figure out how to do chapters intended to be taken on with a full team of units, using only one unit. It really makes you approach the game in a different and interesting way. Back when I released part 1, I was actually under the impression that it could not be done, and I had prepared for a wave of disappointed comments at my failure in the Garrick Mark Defense chapter. Now that I've beaten it, that makes the victory all the more sweet. It's also not hurting that the last part did really well and drew in a bunch of new viewers, to whom I'd like to say, hey, thanks for watching, and I hope you stick around. Hello. If this video inspired you to do your own solo runs, I'd say go for it, they can be a lot of fun. Don't get too hung up on a rule set though, I chose to go with the most hardcore of rule sets where I only allow Byleth to ever see combat, but for other routes or character choices in three houses that might be a tad too difficult, since you'd have to keep other units out of combat all the time. You might want to, you know, relax the rules a little. At the same time, figuring out how to keep other units out of combat can be a very interesting part of playing. Since part 1 did so well, I'm definitely going to be doing more runs like this in the future. I actually have a bit of my next run planned out already. I asked my Patreons what they would like to see the most, and I held a poll based on that, so if you're curious what the next solo is going to be, you should check out my community tab. Oh, and speaking of my Patreons, they are the reason that I can make these heavily edited videos while still paying the bills, so thanks a bunch of them. Especially my 8 tier Patreons on your screen right now, 
and especially my S tier Patreons, Aqua Clash, Boots, 42, Colin, Command List, Corey, Crimson Blader, Hiliosan, Hunty Wunty, Ice Lake, Jacob, Moo, Nikhil, P. Vladias, Rhesus Puffs, Scott Mitchell, Skyler, Stuart Graves, and Sword Locked. If I mispronounce them, let me know. And also Beauty Incarnate, Giant Corkscrew, and Seraph. I did not forget you guys, it just took me a while to edit this after recording. And also let me know in the comments down below what solo runs you've done or are planning on doing. And while you're down there, don't forget to solo the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Almost forgot the most important part. Um, Bye, Beth, Mary, Dorothea. I love you.